thanks everybody once again for being here. Um, let me introduce, without further ado, Dr. Sean Hassler, 2010 graduate of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. He has talked a lot in the past three years and can tell us all about his adventures in global medicine. Thanks for having me. Uh, how's my how's my volume? Am I good? Okay. So um, I've I've given a few other talks about our experiences in in Haiti and Mexico and with the chapter and the nonprofit, etc. And I I don't like to um, to reinvent the wheel. So um, this is intended to be information that's um, new and and um, not in those previous lectures. So. Anybody recognize this shot on the left? No. That's Bryce, Kate Purvis, Kumar, Johanna, Lauren Cottom, all helping push a dead tap tap in Haiti. OK. Yes, I actually copied that smorgasbord from Wikipedia that had all the right annotations. I guess it's a Swedish word. So I would like to talk about my journey from being a fourth year medical school student to today. We're going to talk a bit about um, how NWB Haiti is operating, how it got to where it is, some opportunities for you and the profession to expand in global health, a little bit about um, NGOs, um, just a touch on them and uh, other actual government organizations, and some resources for further learning. Um, we have, as I said, some previous videos that discuss some of the more nitty-gritty about how to actually start or manage a nonprofit, and more of the detailed how to do natural medicine specifically, like the different treatments, et cetera, um, in, in our YouTube talks. And I will also have some links to resources at the end. And you're all welcome to have this PowerPoint, too. So um, as a fourth year student, I was already married to Dr. Sarah, and we were looking at some different options for where we wanted to practice. We knew we wanted to go global. We were a couple months before graduation and didn't have something solid lined up, and we're starting to panic. But um, literally within two weeks of each other, three opportunities presented themselves. We met a successful businessman in Mexico, in Rocky Point actually, who um, was basically offering to give us a space to work, either for low-income patients or to have a low-income clinic somewhere else and then to actually use his space to make money. A family friend of Sarah's who ran an orphanage in the Dominican Republic, which was a more volunteer-focused um, program, and then Haiti with a new group called Mama Baby Haiti that was starting with a group of midwives from Oregon, and they wanted to establish a birth center. And so we ended up going with Haiti after, after exploring all of the options. It, the country really spoke to us. We had read about it extensively um, and, and thought that it would be a good start. How little did we know? <laughs> it's one of the hardest countries to work in the world. Um, but for the organizations that are making it there, I think they could easily work in other countries too. So um, you might want to start somewhere easier just to get your feet wet, but we just jumped right in. So we worked with Mama Baby Haiti for about eight months, and then um, it just wasn't really a good fit. Um, we didn't think that they really had the resources to sustain the work that we wanted to do in country. Um, we were interested in birth, and we would help with the prenatals sometimes, but basically we weren't interested in becoming ND midwives, um, and so we parted ways, but decided that we would instead take NWB, which was still a student club with two chapters at the time, incorporate, get our 501c3 paperwork, and actually make it a legitimate nonprofit. And so we did that, and then we were all the time hunting for opportunities to go back to another country. Specifically, Haiti was, was what we had in our hearts. We wanted to get back, continue serving our patients, and expand services. 
So uh, I, I kind of call this the renaissance period of, of NWB when we incorporated, made everything official. And that took a lot of work. I would not underestimate it. And I get a lot of questions from students and even some doctors who just want to take me out to dinner and say, how do you start a nonprofit? And we'll get to reasons maybe why you should or should not do that. But it's more work than you would imagine to do it legitimately. In 2012, we were invited back to Mama Baby Haiti. They um, were looking to have another organization or a group of individuals come in and, and help them renovate their program and their finances. So we went back for a month and it didn't work out again. And so at the end of 2012, all these students from, specifically from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine where we have a chapter, started asking us about spring break. Are we gonna do another Haiti trip? Are there any other opportunities, et cetera? And so we thought maybe this is the time to launch it. And so we did, we jumped, jumped in head first, started um, booking volunteers. We already had a place in mind. Um, there was a doctor we wanted to work with, et cetera. So I'm going to, to borrow from Dr. Paul Farmer here with a term that he calls hermeneutics of generosity, which kind of is, like saying giving the benefit of the doubt to generally good people who could use it. So nobody is perfect and when you're in these very raw situations in a new culture, people's flaws come out and also the best things about them come out. It really boils down human nature to its core and you have to do your best to give people the benefit of the doubt because you probably aren't doing that well either. <laughs> as much as you'd like to think it, um, stress will come out of you in ways that were unexpected too. You're all in medical school, so you basically know what I'm talking about, but it's a different kind of, um, of stress, discovery, um, self-development that's all happening at the same time when you move to a new country and try to do this work. So adopt that mindset, but when there are serious problems, don't sweep them under the rug. It's best to approach them head on. Earlier the better, um, while you're still in good graces with everybody. <laughs> you know more than you think. Um, you'll hear Dr. Sensenig say this a lot, and, and I completely agree with it. When you graduate, you have a very good base from which to begin practicing, a good base of knowledge that really makes you, I think, an expert in natural medicine. And you want to really develop from there. Um, focus on your therapies that are low cost and sustainable. So you might be really into some exotic therapy that costs thousands of dollars. Something. And that's great, but that may or may not translate into um, a resource poor community. So I think you should focus on nutrition, physical medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy those really core naturopathic therapies where you can either use your hands, use the food or plants around you, um, or maybe you have to import some needles or something, but very low cost, easy to really scale. And another lesson is to, and, and I do say this in all of my talks, is to build passive income early. Um, as much as possible, you don't wanna be, a, um, you don't wanna be held down by, by finances in the decisions that you're making. And if you are independently making money without needing to do much work, that really opens your options to doing, to doing global health because there are a lot more stipend internship um, type positions where you can learn than there are fully nice salary, pay off your student loans positions available. So this is something that I had read about um, extensively. I had all these plans and never pulled the trigger until recently, and now we have the picture on the left, Dr. Sarah's Pronatal Wellness, which is a supplement that we've created to help us become financially independent from you know, needing, basically needing to be paid for the global health work. So um, it's been that long. I've been out three years and we just launched it. So do, start doing that work soon. And th there will be a link on the resources to do that. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time because this is a new talk. It's a new haircut, and both are a little bit rough right now, so bear with me. 
bear with me. I'm getting over like a sinus thing. So um, in February 2013, we decided to launch and there was a hotel, a kind of converted hotel and there were some families living there. There was a doctor practicing underneath. There was actually a few doctors we found out. And it was actually really good because we could house volunteers in these little kind of like hotel suite rooms that had two beds each. They each had their own bathroom. They were all in a hallway lined up nice. Um, we had this roof space. We built a cool um, like thatched roof structure. We built a kitchen there. There was a nice garden space that we were able to use. It was great. Um, and the initial plan was to work alongside that Haitian doctor, do some mobile clinics, um, and basically start building a network of clinics in which we could work and, and Haitian doctors to work with, share our information and learn from them as well because they know much more tropical medicine than we do and we know much more natural medicine. So it makes sense to work together. And again, not, not go in there and create a parallel system and not go in there and reinvent the wheel, of what's already going on. We also wanted to be hiring and training some community health workers which has proved more difficult than we thought. And, and as I mentioned before, community gardening, specifically for um, the families of our malnutrition patients, who are the poorest, um, and the children are suffering and not growing. So um, we had much success with that and, and some changes. We had some staff changes, which um, which is very common, common in Haiti. They, there's a lot of temporary work there. 75% of people do not have long-term steady employment. It's seasonal or it's just really hard to get by or they're old and they're not really able to make much money. So they just pick some plantains and try to sell them at the market or something like that. Longer term employment is um, more difficult to maintain as a white person in Haiti, um, there are cultural barriers that pop up that are difficult to deal with on both sides because we, we grew up here in North America with a certain set of expectations about how the world works and how work works. And they have a completely, they went to different schools if they went to school. Um, the culture is just very much different. So sometimes that clashes, but you do your best to learn, learn and adapt. So we had some staff changes, including a health worker, um, a gardener, and we've, we've had cooks change. I mean, there's, just, there's a lot more management of people than you would expect if you're actually running things in country. Uh, we had a location change too when the landlord decided to do something else with the building, and so everybody went in the span of about a week. And luckily, we, um, we have some good friends in the community. And we had already toured a house on behalf of another organization that was looking for a place to move. And so we moved in, in about 24 hours. And it, it actually worked out really well. This building is really well suited for us. So um, it, it also has not worked out yet to work as closely with the Haitian doctor as we'd like. And we're trying, trying, trying. We know that this model works. We just haven't found the right combination um, of a doctor and the way that we want to work with them. So always learning. So the only constant is change. Be flexible like Gumby. I'm borrowing that from Orphanage. Now it's called Outreach 360. It was Orphanage Outreach in the DR um, as one of their volunteer slogans. Does everybody remember Gumby? Last time I brought that up, nobody knew who Gumby was. And I was Felt really old. I'm not that old. Okay. Claymation coming. Okay. Um, plan for contingency. Um, there's there's no harm in in having a backup plan. And some people, especially in this profession, really buy into wishful thinking, and they think by having a plan B or um, not wanting something that it makes it happen. Um, sorry, that's false. It's really good to have a backup plan like we did for the building change so that that move was as painless as it could be. If you had completely put all your eggs in one basket in a foreign country, 
foreign culture with a shoestring budget probably shouldn't be there. Don't trust anyone absolutely. You can have a lot of trust in people, but you never ever know when their situation might change, especially in um, a country with such vast poverty as Haiti, where they, someone could die in their family, the breadwinner in someone's family could die, and now they have to go to work or something. As, as a foreigner, you might look at the changes that are happening around you and be completely clueless, but usually it's a result of people's environments. So, um, again, kind of like having, having that plan B. If you have a really good worker, do your best to make that worker happy, keep open communication, etc. But nobody is, is irreplaceable, not, not even you. Network early and often as well. Um, this is where we've actually had a lot of success with talking to other NGOs in the area and talking to the Haitian government. And I would suggest that you do that as soon as you land, actually before you even get there, if possible. Do as much research as you can. Here's a Stitch 360 shot of our new place, which has every kind of fruit tree in Haiti. It's amazing. Is my volume still good? Can you all hear me? Okay. I want to talk a little bit about health education. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. So um, we had a sociology student come down, and he wanted to do health education. And we were approaching it kind of how you would naturally do it, trained as a naturopathic doctor. You'd get up in front of a bunch of people, just like you would at Whole Foods or something, and you have a topic, and you just start talking about it. And it seemed like it worked because culturally Haitians will defer to an authority figure in that kind of classroom setting and nod and seem to understand and, and give you gestures that things are working. But then as far as adopting it, you have no idea. So um, what Brad wanted to do instead was approach it from a more Socratic perspective. So he did a literature search on best practices in health education. And here's our framework. I don't want to say formula because it has to be adapted to your audience. But basically, you want to identify first who it is you want to speak to. How do you want to most efficiently spread information in the community? Maybe everybody goes to church, and you can go on Sunday to the Baptist church, like Kelsey did with us, and talk to the youth about what they're doing. It could be sexual health, it could be hygiene, whatever it is that's important to them. You could pick teachers because they're already teaching the community and they know how to do it in that culture, and then give them information if they're willing, if, if they're wanting to know it, and then have them translate it to the people. That's a really good way to go. You could talk to artists to make murals or songs again, in a way that's fitting right in with what the culture already does. So start by asking what they want to know. So if you're talking to teachers, again, avoid coming in like the doctor, like the top of society that knows everything and is going to tell them what to do. Um, we actually had the most success of all the talks we did when we went to teachers and started by saying, we are here because your headmaster, whoever, would like to do some more work in health, some more education in health. And we're here to learn how you would like to teach about health because you know how to teach. You're an expert in teaching, and we're experts in health. So we're going to share our information, and we'd like you to tell us how to teach it. And that immediately broke that barrier and put us more on the same level. So then we ask, what do you want to know? What are the big health issues in the community? What are questions that you have about health? We didn't come in and say, here's what we're going to talk about. When we took those questions, we pulled them together. And then chunked them into what would be answered together. So say people asked, 
one question about STDs and three questions about skin. Maybe talk about skin kind of all the same, how it has a lot to do with the diet and proper hygiene, et cetera, and STDs is a different conversation. So you kind of chunk those answers together that have the questions together that have the same answers. And then we segue into what we developed specifically for Haiti, although you could probably use it in other places, the triangle of basic health. So we talk about having good food, and we talk about basically good and bad foods, which is maybe oversimplified, but it works. Having enough food, good water, meaning clean water, not sugar water and sodas. Having enough water, so they're not dehydrated. So these are the main things that are going on specifically in Haiti, and they'll be different different places. And then having healthy emotion processing, and the other main issue that we've identified is that people come to the doctor and they have little idea about what's going on with them. They do not give a very good history that lends itself well to medical decision making. Um, they don't know when things started, the timelines, etc. And sometimes they just, it hurts. What hurts? Oh, everything hurts. And everything kind of mixes together and makes it very difficult. And so when you hear s horror stories about um, doctors abroad being, being poorly trained and, and using bad medicine, many times it's, it's an issue with um, Western medicine being a relatively new thing in that country and people not knowing how to go to the doctor and be a well-informed patient giving good information. And so a lot of the misdiagnoses that we hear about are because that doctor had 100 people in line to take care of, one doctor for 10,000 people in Haiti, and they're going off of brief physical exams and really an incomplete, difficult to piece together history that for us sometimes takes an hour. And there are cultural barriers, there's a language barrier there, but still just really trying to piece things together to find out what's going on. So before you start blaming the individual doctors, think about the situation that's, the whole system that's creating that. So bodily awareness. And so from there, we segue into something interactive. So for kids, where, again, it's a more simplified version of this, it's a little more like, who likes to drink soda? Raise your hand. That, you know, it's a little more fun and, and less um, you know, talking to professional style. We'll use songs, because we found that songs are the main way that people really communicate and remember things in Haiti. And so we taught some kids a song, and then when Kelsey came like two weeks later, they remembered every word to that song. It was about washing your hands and eating good food and drinking water or something like that. Pretty basic, and they remembered every word of it. And I can't say the same about any of the other education we did. Um, kids also seem to like dances, if you can make a dance, et cetera. And for the adults, we kind of went into this yoga flow to teach them some posture exercises, to notice like tension either being present or being relieved during those exercises and breathing exercises to get people into their bodies to kind of set the frame for when they go to the doctor that they can talk about what they're feeling, when they feel it, et cetera. So, and then for professionals, we be begin brainstorming ways to translate this information to the culture. So, again, going a little bit faster. Opportunities in global health on, excuse me, on the individual level, starting your own NGO. Um, we've had a series of talks about doing this with the emphasis not on starting, but just making sure that everything in an NGO is set and so that you know what goes on in a well-managed NGO so that you can be very beneficial to that NGO aside from your medical skills. It's a lot more work than you think. Um, you can join an NGO, make sure it's a good fit. Um, again, I. Um, for more information on that, check out the YouTube videos. Um, I don't want to rehash that too much, but the information is there. Um, as far as the naturopathic profession, we have a ways to go in, in expanding into the global health arena. And um, Dr. Rick Kirshner gave a keynote at AANP two years ago. And um, Dr. Oz gets a lot of flack in the naturopathic profession for being really hyped and, you know, here's everything about this herb that could help you lose 30 pounds. And you know, he's, he's pretty flashy. But when he's had NDs on his show, 
before he started calling them <laughs> even naturopathic doctors, the caption was, expert in natural medicine. And that's, that's good. That's actually exactly what we are, right? So we're, we're many other things too, but if you needed a phrase to explain what you do, you're an expert in natural medicine. So remember this when you are looking at global health and approaching these different NGOs, that really that's your best role. That's what you've been spending four years, well, two years for you guys, right? Two years doing. Um, and that knowledge is in some places not well valued and in some places very well valued. Some of these new organizations are trying to incorporate more natural methods and learn about the plants that people are using, et cetera. Um, these professional barriers tend to break down overseas, like the us and them, the NDs and the MDs and the DOs and the traditional healers. Um, sometimes it gets really mixed up and that actually makes it really easy to come into it. In some countries, they're not too happy with natural medicine and they're making big national pushes to change things. So um, do research before you go. I think we fit well in bridging the, the knowledge gap um, and also just bridging the professional gap between traditional healers and conventional doctors um, because we're able to do both. And you, you need someone who's able to do both in order to bring them together. Um, I also think, uh, and this is maybe a little controversial, I think you can simplify naturopathic medicine and hack it to make it digestible to people who are otherwise without access to it. So I don't think you have to go to school for four years and spend $200,000 to learn how to eat well or to teach people how to eat well. And that's really the basis, the basis of naturopathic medicine, the basis of our health, is what we're doing with food, what we're doing with water, what we're doing with motion of our bodies and with emotions, right? That's kind of, those are the cornerstones. And I think you can teach that to a person who hasn't been to school and then teach them to spread it on. As far as diagnosing more complicated conditions and really managing people and knowing medications and if something's interacting, if something's emergency, that obviously takes a lot more training and that's what is so valuable about your training. But much of what you do can be boiled down and spread to the entire country easily. You do it with community health workers. So um, our community health workers that we have been training and there are basically three <laughs> so far. We just hired a new one last week. Um, basic health training, where there is no doctor, not the organization that Kelsey's going to volunteer with in Thailand, but the book, Where There's No Doctor, is an excellent manual that makes it really simple. And the same, um, I should have put it on the resource list, the same publisher, Hesperian, also has a book called Helping Health Workers Learn that teaches you better ways to teach health workers using songs and pictures and stories and um, solid, um, you know, physical concrete teaching tools instead of just talking at them. Um, I think nutrition, local botanicals, and physical medicine are amazing too. And we've just stumbled on a really great manual about local botanicals in Haiti that we are kind of codifying, taking the Latin, putting it on a big spreadsheet and comparing it to our current body of knowledge about those same plants from you know, a Western eclectic perspective. I also think research is very important and NCNM is making big strides with this. They have a whole department um, through HealthGOT doing um, global health research and a degree program for that too. Research will help us evolve better ways to approach these situations. For example, you could come up with a simple test to determine if people are retaining and actually using the information from your health classes. You could do one group or one set of community clusters, a standard you're getting up and talking in front of them about the topic, and the other one, the more interactive style that we've been talking about, boom, really easy, huh? Research doesn't have to be really complicated, doesn't have to be test tubes. Also helps to disseminate this knowledge 
because people actually do read journals. And also for funding, because you can get grants for that kind of research. So again, I'm always running over time. Um, determinants of health, it's going to make this Socratic, but let's just say clean water, enough water, good food, enough food, healthy emotions, maybe having food, period, having money, period, meaning in the work, a sense of community, a sense of support in case something goes wrong in your life, that you have people to back you up. Right? All these things are kind of determining your health. And as physicians, you are a piece of that, and you're trained very well in a piece of that. But to me, if you really want to build the health of the community, you need more than just medicine. And this is where net networking and collaborating with other NGOs is really important. So. First, um, finding out how the government views what you do is very important. And we, we knew that there were some other natural medicine projects in Haiti, and the, the government didn't seem hostile toward that. So when we landed a few weeks later, we went straight to the Minister of Health in the North and just explained what we do. And he said, well, do you have a license in the United States? And we said, yes. And he said, well, then it's all good. <laughs> so we thought we might have to do all this explaining and everything. And he looked at our licenses. It's like, that's great. Just keep me updated on what you're doing. There's so much, there's so much going on in the country that it's, the Ministry of Health is more focused on hearing about what's going on, because there's so much, than it is about really policing everything and coordinating things. It's an, it's an underfunded, understaffed department, unfortunately. So. They're happy for, for any collaboration that NGOs can propose. Um, good to have emergency care for referral. Good to have midwives for referral. There are traditional midwives in just about every culture around the world. Um, they might be kind of elusive if the government is hostile toward them. Or there might even be training programs to help them get more formal training. Agriculture, gardening, and malnutrition. It's important to be able to feed your patients clean water, public health, education, um, development. If you have patients who could use a job, <laughs> you don't know. You can't hire them because your NGO is not big enough or you don't have a place for them. Places, uh, development places that help with job skills and job placement. Quick tip on formal coordination. You want to clearly define your roles with NGOs and sign an MOU, which stands for Memorandum of Understanding that both your boards will draft and then vote on and then your executive directors slash CEOs, whatever, will sign it, clearly defining everything that goes on. You'll especially need this to set you up for grants. So quick links to some resources. Unite for Sight has some really good online courses in their Global Health University. They have some certificate courses. For more clinical nitty gritty, we have a Haiti clinical crash course that's available to all of our volunteers. And I have one for Rocky Point too, but it's not on the website. Um, two lectures about global health and nonprofit things. I r highly re recommend the book Mountains Beyond Mountains, especially if you're interested about Haiti, but really the philosophy of global health in general. For messaging and marketing slash keeping your organization with a coherent message and mission, um, I really like the book Made to Stick. It's worth a read, even if you're not that interested in global health and you just want to do private practice. It teaches you ways to make your messages more sticky and universal. Passive income, I like Four Hour Work Week. Everybody who knows me has probably heard me talk about this book repeatedly. It's amazing, it's a good start, um, and it is enough to be able to start some passive income on your own. As far as getting experience, um, Dr. Highfield asked me if I had any additional training or certifications to do global health, and I kind of laughed to myself. No, just School of Hard Knocks. Everything has been naturopathic school, doing as much extra um, volunteering as I could during school, and then a little bit after school, and just jumping in there and doing that. Um, Unite for Sight didn't have the amazing things they had. I had read Where There Is No Doctor and Mountains Beyond Mountains and some of Paul Farmer's books to, to get a better idea, but there's no 
no replacement for experience. So NWB has trips to Rocky Point in Haiti. Haiti is booking up right now. Um, there are other naturopathic and other groups, NMGH in Guatemala, that actually has a much more community health focused model. They have a big group of community health workers that are doing work for them. Um, I really like their model. Theme Africa, I think Bryce and Kelsey might go there in Kenya um, with Dr. Amit Agarwal, who's an ND, Mercy in Action, where there's no doctor, et cetera. And CNM has a global health research program, which is kind of, um, in my mind, maybe I'm incorrect, um, kind of an abbreviated MPH. Um, it's, it's a one-year master's program. And I have heard NCNM is working on a fifth-year ND certificate in global health, and I don't have any more detail beyond that. Um, and we are also working on a more comprehensive global health course. So I want to thank you for having me, and um, Dr. Highfield and I wanted to open this to questions and discussion and, and anything else you want to talk about during your finals week. Don't everybody ask at once. Yes. What's your name? Sorry. Bianca. Bianca. I mean, like financially free and that you guys developed a supplement. That's awesome. But like you said, it took you three years to do. So do you have any tips on the before you're free? Like, um, you, I actually, I had emailed um, the board, the, um, the Arizona board, about doing this as a student, um, you could do a blog with health information. You have to be really careful not to give health advice um, or in any way to, to show yourself as a doctor. Um, some blogs can be monetized with advertisements, etc. cetera. Um, we have a house and we rent a room in that house. Um, I guess you could sublet if you had an apartment. And then there's someone to help take care of your house while you're gone. Um, Supplements were just the easiest thing for me because I've always had that brain. I have like a dozen formulas in my head that we could have developed. We picked one. It didn't actually take me three years to do it. I just didn't do anything for three years. The, the actual incorporating, um, doing the sampling with the contract manufacturer, which was NutriCap, um, developing website, getting a trademark and everything was about six months, maybe a little under six months if we had done it quickly. Um, so it doesn't have to take that long. I, I really would look at what you already do or what you're very knowledgeable about and figure out ways to make information products or a DVD or something based on that. Because you all had hobbies before you came here, hobbies that you no longer have because you're in med school, right? Um, and I think there are ways to bridge some of those hobbies with medicine in really innovative ways. So it's about as detailed as I can get. Read the four hour work week. <laughs> so I hope. What do you do in cases where a patient has a very emergent condition or, or, or might need some conventional treatment? What do you do in that case? Uh, I refer. Um, there, there is a hospital, there's a public hospital in Haiti, and um, the, care, the care is generally free, um, at least getting in the door and being seen, the consult, et cetera, but the medicines and all the supplies take money. So sometimes, um, we actually charge a small fee in order to be um, legitimate with the public, uh, sorry, with the Ministry of Health, to not really tick off all the local doctors um, we charge a very small fee, and usually that money gets pulled into sending someone to the hospital that day. So we, we don't actually make a profit, per se, off of those fees. Um, and just having other doctors to refer to, es especially if you're going to be in and out, and maybe you have a health worker who can help with follow-up, but for something like blood pressure medication that really they need to be on consistently, need to have it monitored, um, and have it tweaked, that really should be someone who's there all the time. Um, and, and it really builds bridges to refer patients to local doctors. 
but we're again we're doing we're not just doing that we're doing our education having them drink some hibiscus tea and cut their salt and their MSG start exercising stress relief like all those other things that also help but in some cases the the blood pressure is 240 over 120 that will not get normal with lifestyle modification that's been high for a very long time and they will need some medications they could have a stroke at any second good question but yeah find somewhere to refer to to refer to some kind of hospital yes Okay, so the question is about getting, getting space to work. Uh, it, it depends on the country. So in, in Mexico, for instance, you can, as a foreigner, get land, but you don't fully own it, and it, kind of, it like expires after seven years. Um, in, in Haiti, foreigners can, but they have to go through a, a pretty long process of becoming very official with the government getting your national identification and you know tax information and, and all that um, typically you'll be renting and so there's inherent risk with that because you don't outright own it and even if you did outright own it in, in some countries like they can still just come in and, and <laughs> take all your stuff if they want to um, we are renting we so the first place at mama baby they um, the, the husband who's on the board, so he's the one who's not a midwife, flew in, found a translator, and then said, do you know any houses? And they just started looking. Um, and so uh, the translator guy knew someone who owned some buildings, and that's how they found that building. Well, we worked there, and they were renting, and they've since moved um, and had issues with that landlord. We knew of this other place and had been talking to the doctor about collaborating, et cetera. And so it was a natural fit when it came time for us to come down. And then we had been looking for houses through our connections for, for Mama Baby because they were looking to move. And so that's how we knew about this other house. It's actually a big community leader. She is um, a pastor and school headmaster at the main place where we do our mobile clinics weekly. Um, and she owns a couple other things and has some money and her husband's in the U.S. and she's been an amazing support to us and we do trust her. So it's big in relationships. Everything is about relationships. And, and when, I, when I had the, the overview and I said NGOs are made of people, it's completely true. Um, I've met more NGOs from going to the local hotel and just having lunch and then just running into somebody or going to a social gathering like somebody's birthday party and then all the other NGO people are there like they kind of make a network the other um, the other nice thing about being up in the north of Haiti is that there's an organization called the Cap Haitian Health Network that is an informational resource and it um, it has some meetings meet and greets where you can meet other organizations and talk about what you do and they talk about what they do. Um, so that's, that's really been instrumental in us finding other organizations. Were you there when the, was it cholera? That's a big deal? Cholera came, I think, two weeks before we landed from a UN base. Any experience, any words of wisdom? Oh, um, the, yeah. The, um, their, their success, I think, has largely been um, health education because cholera does really well in, in rivers and streams, kind of like Giardia. And once it's there, it stays there for a while. In a population that hasn't had um, endemic cholera for a long time, there will not be much immunity, much passive immunity. 
So in some places where there is cholera, there can be waves of it, but they're maintained by most people have had some antibodies to it within a decade or so. I, th I think Haiti hadn't been exposed in like 50 years, so most of those people had passed away. Um, there wasn't much natural protection. And this was a very virulent strain from Nepal, um, which was really rough. Cholera, so um, in terms of preventing it, it's washing hands, taking care of your water. You can put a water bottle, a clear bottle, in the sun for six hours, and that will kill pretty much all of the human pathogens in there. Um, clinically, the, the main thing is hydration. In most cases of diarrhea, oral rehydration is enough if they're able to keep food down. About half, maybe a third to half, of the cholera patients who were symptomatic, and many of them are not symptomatic, although this is a very virulent strain, have a lot of vomiting. And so they're not able to keep that down. And so you go to IV rehydration, ringers is really common. Um, or even rectal rehydration, you can cut a butterfly needle off. Very, very slow drips, so you're not actually inducing more osmotic diarrhea. Um, We've had some success. We have not treated many of these acute cases, by the way. Um, there are color treatment centers set up all over the place, and people actually did a pretty good job of getting to them, even though they were pretty overcrowded. And for really acute patients, we would get them to the hospital because it was just above what we were able to do in a mobile clinic. Um, we had some su success with homeopathy. I walked into a hospital where some of our people were working, and I saw a man just turn over and projectile vomit into a trash can. So I went Ipecac. It's that half second. You didn't even think about it. It's just automatic. And within about half an hour, he was walking around and not completely out of the woods, but significantly better. Um, we've done arsenicum and aconite. Um, Potophyllum is a common remedy for really painless, explosive, watery diarrhea. Um, Nux, if there's a lot of vomiting, but really if there's a lot of vomiting, maybe I'll give a remedy, but I'm also gonna give a medication to stop it because we're talking about life and death here. This isn't like you had some bad sushi and you get a 24 hour bug. Um, people are dying in 10 hours or less with cholera. They're already malnourished, they're already dehydrated, and then they're sick and they're, they don't have much reserve. And it's a very nasty bug. So um, when you are orally rehydrating, Emergency is not enough. Um, there's not enough chloride in there, really not enough sodium in there. So you can take six teaspoons of sugar, um, half a teaspoon of salt, and a liter of water, and that's easy oral rehydration solution, or you can get packs. Um, we, for severe cases, we were also, um, I think they, were, they might give IV antibiotics, but they pretty much were out of supplies by the time everything really hit. If people can keep um, water down, you can take ciprodoxycycline or azithromycin too to really shorten the duration. And by the time people start getting sick, you don't know how quickly it will, it will become severe. So... <laughs> Cholera, yeah, I, I have a, a pretty balanced view of cholera. It, it's, it's a life-threatening illness, that, that strain. Any other questions for our docs? Well, let's give a big thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Feel free to email me if you have any questions or catch me on Facebook or something.